Hello everyone, and welcome. You may have seen this video of Brett Copeland explaining how the space shuttle used to land. Go and watch it if you haven't, it is very entertaining. Anyway, if you're here, you probably have some interest in either spaceflight or numerical optimization. And you may be thinking, okay, so in that video Brett explained how the shuttle goes up and down, and banks left and right to control the descent. But how much does it need to turn either way at each instant of the trajectory? In this video, I want to show you a method that allows to solve this problem and to get the actual numbers for the state of the vehicle over time. My goal is to show that formulating this kind of problems is actually not that difficult with all the tools that are available to us nowadays. So let's start. I will be using this book by John Tibbetts, which talks about numerical optimization. We are going to be using a method called direct transcription. And direct transcription works by taking a continuous trajectory, like this one, over time, and transforming it into a vector of points. Once we have a list of all these points, which represent the state of the vehicle and the commands over time, so this is our trajectory, we need to make sure that the states between one time step and the next one are not violating the laws of physics. For example, if you have a car, and for time equals zero seconds, we know that the car is at the position equals zero, and it's going forward at a speed of two meters per second, then we know in exactly one second the car will have traveled two meters, right? This is assuming that there is zero acceleration, so the velocity will remain constant uh, as the car drives by. This is pretty intuitive, right? And it happens in real life because those are the laws of physics, but since we are discretizing a trajectory into different points, we need to make sure that those points are respecting those laws. Okay, so let's actually move on to the Space Shuttle Reentry Trajectory problem. It's actually an example on this book, on chapter 6, and this is where I got most of the information I needed to, to make this video. So it starts by telling us the differential equations uh, that govern the vehicle. These are all saying how the vehicle is affected if it has a certain velocity at a certain altitude and so on. And on the bottom of the page here you can see the variables that uh, we use to describe the system. The two last ones are going to be the commands that we can uh, send to the, to the shuttle. We can change how we are banking and uh, we can change our angle of attack as well. On the next page we have like a bunch of aerodynamic and atmospheric forces that are and how they how they affect the the vehicle. And finally we have some details about the initial conditions of the system. So these are going to be the inputs to our problem. And then we also have the information about the requirements for the final point of the trajectory. For the space shuttle problem, we are interested in maximizing the cross range, which is the final latitude of the space shuttle. You can see here that uh, this solid line is the equator, and those two lines are the trajectory of the space shuttle, and we are curving away from the equator, and we want to maximize the distance at which we are going to be at the end of the trajectory from the equator. So this is the cross range, and this is the value that we are going to be maximizing. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to this Jupyter notebook, which I prepared already. The first cell that we have here is basically the constants that were in the book. I just copy and pasted exactly as they were in the book. They are the aerodynamic and atmospheric forces on the vehicle. These are some auxiliary functions. Again, I copy-pasted this exactly as they were from, from the book. Then here we have the DAEs. So these are the differential algebraic system of equations describing the motions of the vehicle. Don't get too scared about the name. Basically, they are the functions saying how the motion of the vehicle is affected under certain circumstances. Below the DAEs, I have the variables defining the initial conditions. So these are again straight from the book and then the final conditions. Then I build these two vectors. S is the initial state, T is the final state. 
for x, s, I use all the variables that describe the initial conditions of the vehicle. And for the final conditions, I'm using the required velocity, altitude, and flight path angle. But you can see that for the other variables, I'm using the values from the initial conditions. This is okay, because we're going to use this only as an initial guess to the problem. And then the solver, when it's trying to make sense of all these numbers, is going to converge and nail down the right numbers that solve the problem. So now starts the direct transcription formulation. Basically, we need to split the trajectory into a certain number of segments. And the reason why I chose 2008 is because I'm cheating a bit, and I already know more or less what's the optimal length of the trajectory, which is around 33 minutes. So here we are just interpolating the initial conditions to the final conditions, and these are going to be the decision variables that the numerical solver will have to change and adjust in order to find the correct numbers to make this all work. So underneath here, these are just variables that are holding the indices of each variable in each point. Doesn't matter too much. So this is going to be our integration method. And then we need to describe the forward dynamics of the system. So if we change the banking angle or if we change the flight path angle, given the current state, so those are the altitude velocity, all the other numbers describing the current state, how are those going to be affected? So you can see here that I have a, a bunch of Euler steps being performed. Then down here, I have two callbacks. They evaluate the forward dynamics function and the callback below is just evaluating the Jacobian of the dynamics function, which basically tell you how much some quantity which you are interested in changes, how much it changes as a function of a change in some other variable. So this is related to the rate of change. That's all you need to know for now. And that concludes all the functions and variables that we need to have pre-specified before running the actual optimization. I'm going to be using Nitro, which is an optimization software library for finding solutions to continuous problems just like this one. The first thing we do is to tell it how many variables there are. Basically, n is just a number of decision variables. Then, ideally, we would like to let the solver know that there is an initial guess. And if you remember, this is just our linear interpolation from the initial time step to the final time step. We just linearly interpolate the state of the system. We need to let the solver know that some of these variables have some lower and upper bounds. I had a version where the time step between each two points that we have discretized could vary, but I was kind of struggling to get it to work as well as if I had it just fixed. So for this example, I just fixed it to one second. So in between each two points, there will always be one second time step, which is quite big for doing these kind of integrations. But this is just an approximation anyway, and we'll go with it. We also have to fix the initial and final conditions. We don't want the solver to change those. Okay, the next step is to proceed to the constraints. So we let the solver know how many constraints there are. And basically, these are going to be the rules between each two pair of mesh points. These are called the defect constraints. And this is what the forward dynamics was all about. Basically, we need to say that the current state of the vehicle plus the increment on this state caused by the current velocity and the commands that we command to the shuttle need to lead to the next point that we have discretized. Then if you remember, we need to define an objective. We are going to be maximizing the final latitude, which is also known as the cross range. Finally, these are just some user options to the solver to let it know which algorithms we would like it to use for solving the problem, for solving linear systems, and so on. Then we just call solve. Once we execute it, the solver starts to do its thing. You can see it's iterating over and over as it's trying to find a solution to our problem. You can see here that the goal of the objective is to be maximized. 
and we also have some information about the number of variables, the number of constraints, how many of them have we bounded above and below, and a bunch of other details. Now you can see that it has finished. Uh, it took 116 iterations. In this column here, you can see the feasibility error. So this is with respect to the dynamic constraints. And it is decreasing because since we started with a linear interpolation between the initial and the final time step, it was not respecting the laws of physics. But the solver is changing that at each iteration and adjusting the values to make it more and more feasible. In this column, you can see the value of the objective increasing because we were maximizing it. And you can see here that the final latitude that we have found is 34.15 degrees. And this took 13 seconds. I think that's quite impressive. All of this took 13 seconds to solve for a trajectory that takes around half an hour to complete in real life. We are only using 2008 points to approximate our trajectory. So this is a point per second, which is very a very, very big approximation. But still, I think, I think this is still quite impressive. Okay, I think the only thing left to do is to check the results. You can see that the plots here for the altitude, velocity, longitude, flight path, latitude, azimuth, they are very, very similar to the actual results presented in the book and to the actual trajectory of the re-entry of the space shuttle. Finally here, a 3D plot of the trajectory. You can see here the rippling effect. It's like a rock skipping on water, but in the space shuttle case, is it going slightly up and down to control its descent as it re-enters the atmosphere. And I think that's it. So if you're interested in running the code, you can try it for yourself. It's on my GitHub. I will leave the link on the description. And I think I'll also write a blog post where I'll include some interactive plots. So just the same plots that are on the Jupyter Notebook for you to check if you want to. So that's the end. I hope this was interesting for you and thanks for watching. See ya.